So good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure uh, seeing most of you, or all of you here today. Uh, I think we have waited uh, for this day, so thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Christian Harrison, and I'm privileged to be facilitating the research uh, seminar series for the School of Business and Creative Industries. As you can see from my background, uh, I'm getting ready for Christmas. <laughs> I think my kids forced me to put on the Christmas tree too early. So I'm sorry for those that, okay, why is it, why is it, why, why does it have a Christmas tree at the background? But either way, it's, it just shows you that uh, it's getting to the end of the year. And before, yeah, I think this is gonna be our last research, not, not uh, of course, uh, we still have one more on the 7th of December as we approach the end of the year. So it's great to have everybody here today. For most of you, uh, of course, we're coming from different places, we're different parts of the world. I know some people are in, in the States at the moment. We have some people in England, we have some people in Scotland. So welcome everyone. I always tell people, try to use the chat box to uh, try to uh, tell us where you're coming from, try to tell us who you are. Please don't hesitate to do that. Let's, let's, know, let's welcome you so you can tell us where you're coming from. And one of our speakers uh, last year said, in short, instead of just telling us where you're coming from, try to introduce yourself in your native language. And we start to see people use Mandarin, we start to see people use Yoruba, we start to see some creative ways of introducing yourself. So please try to tell us where you're coming from and we welcome everyone here today. Uh, it's great uh, that we're gonna be talking about research. And first I would like to tell uh, Dr. Kalyan Bandari, thank you so much for being part of this. I can remember when I reached out to Kalyan and I told Kalyan, I want you to talk about research. He said, yes, Christian, I'm going to do this. And he came up with this. So I'm like, oh, wow, this is great. And we can see from what people are, the number of people that have registered today is like, it's going to be very, very interesting. So no pressure, Kalyan. We have a lot of people still waiting, a lot of people in the waiting room. Yeah. And, they want, and they really want to hear about research. One of the things that we have struggled over time is publishing research. And most importantly, publishing qualitative research. Many journals are usually biased and usually subjective towards quantitative research. So today, we'll be looking at how to publish qualitative research, especially things that there is there's really no uniform rule. But we have an expert who has published widely in this field, and he'll be telling us how he did it. Here's Labia, Spread them open, just so you'll be telling us how we did it, and of course, what we what we need to consider when we're trying to publish uh, qualitative research. Uh, before we proceed, of course, we know the rules of engagement, we know the rules of Zoom. Please try to uh, mute yourself while you're not talking. And I'm always happy when we tend to put our cameras on, no pressure, but I'm happy to see your faces. So you can put your camera on if you want to. I can see a lot of colleagues here, donors and other people have their cameras on. So feel free to put your cameras on. But if of course you don't want to do that, then you can also, you don't need to do that as well. Okay, I can see Jay, that's great, thanks Jay. So it's great to have, and Laura as well. So it's great, put your cameras on, let's see you. Let's let's make it a very, very- Good afternoon, good Christian, one. nice to meet you all. Good afternoon, Jay, as well. So I can see Shai. So put on your cameras if you want. But of course, if you don't have to, then you don't need to, because I know that we might also be in different parts, and that could also be a distraction as well. So that's good. And of course, the final thing before I, I think I talked so much before I stop talking is, uh, of course, you know, there could be, uh, in case there is any fire or anything in your house, so please make, make sure you leave the computer, because life is much more important. And unfortunately, we are doing this online, so we don't, I don't have any uh, coffee or any refreshment, so yeah. you can feel free to get water, and as we progress, I'll move along. But either way, we just need to start the session, and what I will do first is, of course, for those of us that have been attending is to introduce our guest speaker today. We have Dr. Kalyan Badari, and he's the senior, he's a senior lecturer in marketing events and tourism in the School of Business and Creative Industries at the University of the West of Scotland. His research interests are in tourism at heritage sites, governments and tourism public policies, national identity, nationalism, environment and regional development. He has, he completed his PhD on Scottish tourism, like we already know, uh, from University of Glasgow and maintains equal research interest 
on Scottish tourism and the society and culture of his native Nepal. He has authored two books, so we have a very recognized uh, publisher in this space in tourism, nationalism, and national identity. He has published nearly 20 papers in leading journals like Annals of Tourism Research, Environments and Planning C and Current Issues in Tourism. And these journals are leading and that world leading journals, I would, I, would, I would say. So he has published quite a lot. I think uh, uh, Kalyan is very, he's a very humble person and I know Kalyan very well. And he has, he's, of course, he has, I think we do a lot of things to the, listen, together, Kalyan, of course, I'm supervising students, but he's an expert in this space and it's a pleasure to have Kalyan today. And he will be talking us, or talking us through about publishing qualitative research. And after he has given us a presentation, feel free to ask him any question you want to ask uh, Kalyan. He's ready for all your questions today. So thank you, Dr. Kalyan, and thanks everybody for coming today. Thank you very much, Christine, uh, for a very good, uh, what do you say, detail, I'm not good, I'd say a very detailed introduction to my, uh, my research and my background as well. Uh, and also, a very good, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to present in your uh, research forum today. Um, what I will do is uh, I'll start sharing my PowerPoint and then quickly, because I don't really want to waste any time and try to stick to 30 minute time that Christian has actually given me to speak. So, uh, can you see Christian? Can you confirm me like? Yes, yes I can. Brilliant. Okay, but I because I can't really see you guys when I start sharing this. If there's anything wrong, Christian, I would like suddenly if my microphone goes off or anything happens, please uh, use your microphone to inform me. If you, well, I mean, if you write, I probably wouldn't have time to actually look into the chat when I'm speaking. No problem. Excellent, thank you. And um, so, uh, thank you very much, Christian, again, for asking me to present this. And uh, in this presentation today, I would like to actually share my own experience of publishing papers um, in different journals. Now, I am a qualitative researcher, so all I know only about qualitative research. So, if you're looking for some sort of comparative between qualitative and quantitative, then I can only put you, uh, you provide you some insights on publishing the qualitative. Uh, research, so that's what I've actually been doing over the last 10, 15 years. In today's presentation, I'd like to actually focus on uh, like basically key area that we need to focus as a qualitative researcher when preparing our manuscript. Because I believe that there are certain aspects of qualitative research that must be very visible in the paper. Uh, and, that's, and that's something like the journal editors always look for if you're submitting a qualitative paper. So that's one area that I want to actually focus on. So I probably, uh, what I'll do is I'll share my own experience of preparing journal articles and I'll also share some of the advices that I actually got after submitting these articles um, to the journals. I'd also look, uh, provide some insight on what editors look for in qualitative research, uh, basically from a perspective of Submitter basically. So um, it's basically uh, when I submit it, I, I have a kind of a few rejections as well, and some dex rejections as well. And I'll share with that with that one as well. But when I look closely into the dex rejection letters, you can actually clearly see what editors are looking and what is deficient in your paper in your paper. So basically, I'll actually look to that as well. And finally, I will also try to. Um, share my experience of choosing right home for my research and there are different ways we can do it and I'll, these are the main focus that I would like to actually do today. I was also thinking about including some discussion around how to respond to reviewers but later on I realized that it is something uh, that warrants a kind of a full session rather than actually providing a few slides on that so I've decided to actually not include that but if you have any questions on um, that you can actually, we can discuss that during the question and answer session as well. Now, the, the, to start with, uh, be, uh, what I do uh, uh, before starting writing a paper is basically, I normally go through these 10 questions suggested by Petruo in the Journal of Management Studies. 
So basically, when we start writing a paper, we already have done research. So we don't really do research. I mean, start writing and then do research. Basically, we finish our research and then start writing. In that case, basically, we already have information that need to go in paper, but it is not in a proper structured way. So before deciding what to submit and what story I want to tell in my paper, basically, I normally go through these 10 questions. And to do that, I pick a to what is a A4 size papers and try to answer these questions in that not more than two 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 pages. Now this ten these ten questions about what you are focusing on, why that study is important, what we already know about or what we need to know, and what is the main research question that I want to answer in research how I, I aim to address these questions. All these questions like that I've actually shown you in the screen here. I like, try to actually see if I have answered to the, all these questions in my forthcoming or the paper that I'm going to write. Now, if there's any question which I can't really answer, then I'd probably try to find the answer to that question. I mean, sometimes it might be like, a, um, the data, you might actually realize that what you have found does not make strong sense or like doesn't warrant a kind of a publication. In that case, I'd go and collect data again. But the thing is, I wouldn't write a full paper and then go back and do the data research thing. But I'd like to actually first focus on these questions. And one ha once I have answered to these 10 questions, then only I proceed to... Um, writing or a proper structure for my paper. Now, this is very helpful because it will provide a very good uh, sense of what you want to say in a paper first thing and what is your complete story look would look, look like basically. And, uh, and the second thing is if you already have done research, which is a funded research, then probably most of these questions will already be answered uh, when you start writing the, the two pages because um, if it's a funded research, then you've already done some research, background studies, literature review in your funding applications as well. So the, and you've already probably in the funding application, you already decide the research um, gap as well. So be, uh, writing these things, answering these 10 questions in two pages would be much easier if you've already done a kind of uh, some background study. So if you haven't done any background study, you wouldn't know what is the gap. So basically uh, that sometimes can be, uh, you know, difficult so this is the first starting point that i do but uh, i think if uh, i think there's other way around is like you write you can't actually prepare a draft paper uh, complete a draft paper and then come with these questions and then see if you all your draft paper answers all these questions or not if they answer all these questions then i think your draft is ready to go for like a final preparation and then submission as well. And so this is, the, the, but the thing is, the key thing is at any, either at the start of your paper or even after you've finished your writing the paper, at least just make sure that keep this checklist and then try to see if your uh, research or what you're trying to actually say answer these things or not. Now, when writing abstract, um, I would say I, Usually, preparing abstract is important because it is the selling point for your research, and a very well written abstract would definitely attract attention from your editor as well as reviewers as well. Uh, usually, abstract is written written after the draft has already been completed, and then only finally before submission you can actually write abstract. But the key thing about abstract is these six questions. I basically just make sure that the problem is uh, or what was done in research is very clearly stated and information about where your field was, how, what did you do, how the data was collected, what were the findings and why these findings are important are very important part of the whole, uh, part, part of the whole uh, abstract writing. Now, key things to avoid when writing abstract is, um, um, just give me one second because I can't really see the six sidebar because of the, Okay, that's great. Um, so the key thing to write, uh, avoid when writing abstract is, uh, from my experience of 
reviewing papers submitted for different journals, I've actually seen people just reproduce the first paragraph of their paper in the abstract, which is, I don't think is a good idea. So try to avoid repeating a first paragraph of your paper. The second thing I'd say is I would try to re do not repeat any sentence from the main paper in the abstract. So I'd not try to write abstract on its own, a complete um, a piece of work on its own, a complete paragraph on its own. The second thing I've actually seen that from, uh, again, uh, reviewing papers is some sometimes authors misrepresent their paper in abstract means like they claim things so that had they have not achieved in their main paper so that's a quite a common error people make so i normally try to actually check like if I, I, when you complete your work like when you complete your abstract and then relate it with your conclusion of the paper and then see exact is this what you have actually concluded in the apps in the paper because sometimes what you claim is contribution in the abstract is different than what your main contribution is in the paper so just make sure that you do not misrepresent your paper and the third very important thing is different journals have different guidelines and, and word limits for abstract the journals that I, I usually submit have 150 words and sometimes it becomes very challenging to compress all information in that 150 words but um you have to stick to that because in the submission system if you have like a more than 150 words then the submission system automatically deletes ex extra work word uh, so I try to actually stick to that now when i come i actually looked into my own work and then i was actually uh, 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 this particular slide represents how i have actually done that or presented abstract in my um work so you can actually see this is abstract from my own paper which was published in environment planning c uh, so you can actually see that um it suggests what the problem was sometimes you might not exactly say the problem but you can actually state with what study what your study does basically so what was done uh, in this study can actually be also replace the problem. So some, so either you can have a, com if you have like 250 words for abstract, then you can actually use one or two sentence for problem and then go to other parts of the abstract. If you don't really have that many words, then probably instead of actually stating a problem in a very, uh, what is say, a different separate sentence, you can actually just combine with what you've actually done in that study. Uh, 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 and the thing is where is very important if you have chosen a specific field work uh, field then that I, is important to actually introduce and just you can just name the place in when you are uh, articulating your problem but where this search was done is very important now it is important to provide information about uh, the data how you collected your data uh what were the findings and significance and so i don't really want to go to detail about that but the thing is like uh, my point is abstract is has to be clearly presented in the introduction after the abstract in the introduction um i've actually gone through some presentation by chief editors a few important journals and they some of them have actually suggested that you can just talk about the paper uh, its structure and provide some um um signposting in the first paragraph of the paper now you can do that but i, I in my op uh, in my case I, I don't really do that i i'd suggest like providing or articulating problem in the first paragraph would be the right thing to do and i've actually seen this has worked for me uh, so that's very important thing that i normally do but one important thing apart from like setting the problem uh, statement stating the problem and also identifying or establishing your research question clearly which is the purpose of introduction uh, we all know i'd like to highlight two things that i'd normally do in the introduction section of the paper towards the end of introduction one is the paper's usefulness or application for different sectors for example in this paper I, I i highlight in a paragraph of how this paper is important how this study is important to policy community to tourism practitioners and also to the academics working in different disciplines uh, I straight uh, identify that this paper makes a huge, con uh, you know, contribution or uh, has a huge application value in those sector. So I 
state how government can actually benefit from the paper's findings, how practitioners can get uh, can use the paper's findings in improving their own uh, practice, the tourism practices. And then I also identify how different disciplines like tourism studies or geography or sociology, economics, et cetera, can actually also draw insights from this study. So the basically one is the application study to different sector, which I draw normally I highlight in the introduction. The second thing I'd like to highlight here is about the contribution of the paper. Now, some scholars suggest stating or like discussing contribution in the conclusion, which is also not a bad idea, but providing, I normally try to actually provide contribution uh, statement in the introduction um, section, because in that case, someone reads your introduction, they exactly know what, whether this stud, stud, uh, study has made a huge contribution or not, and whether it is worthy of further reading or not. Uh, one important thing about contribution is most of my research now is on Nepal. Now, if I study, uh, if I pro provide findings which are only applicable for Nepal, then probably there, it wouldn't it wouldn't have a kind of a wider appeal for um, journals which are international in nature. So make sure your your contribution is not very much limited to the case discussed. It has to have some relevancy beyond the case discussed. So you can actually see here in the last, uh, almost like last line here in the uh, my paper in the in the introduction chap section. What I do is I try to establish the contribution and I try to establish how this is this can be generalized in the other developing countries context as well. And that's very important part in completing the uh, introduction uh, part of the paper. Then I move to literature review. I don't really want to say why literature review is important or what is the purpose of literature review. I hope everyone, we all know about the purpose of literature review. There are common errors that we make when writing a literature review is about sometimes if you are converting your PhD studies into a paper, then you have to be careful because some, if your PhD has, was done like 10, five, 10 years or for like even three, four years back, then you need to make sure that your literature review is up to date and you have to add new research in the subject area. Second thing is identify key scholars in the subject area of or the topic of your research and make sure that they are properly referred or, or like I have discussed their ideas in the literature review. Now this the second important error that we commonly make is about being very selective in our literature review. And sometimes what happens if you are converting a PhD into a paper, you don't really want to miss any of these references that you've used in your paper. And we tend to, there's a tendency to actually use everything in the paper as well, which is not always good. So make sure that if there are any unnecessary, irrelevant sources for that paper, like it might be, the, the, these sources could be, um, might have been very good, relevant in your PhD study, but in the, for the paper, it might not be that much relevant. So you just actually make sure that you don't really have that one. Now, the third important thing is about avoiding the sequential writing, which means like you just actually say what the different authors say rather than actually combining or like trying to synthesize their ideas. So try to make your literature review more discursive, create a discussion, and then from that discussion, try to draw kind of a, a conclusion which can establish what is the research gap, what are the key debates and where is the gap in that existing debate, which is very important. Do not do reference stacking, which basically means like you just actually for a small minor point, you use four or five references, which is not all needed. So that's also sometimes uh, if you're a new scholar, I mean, new, new to writing, sometimes you want to impress the reviewers or impress the editors and try to actually do the reference stacking by actually bringing all these all everything that you've read in the past. The other uh, important thing uh, I think is if we are new, uh, uh, beginning to write your journal papers is um, finding appropriate phrase to actually describe things. I find this Manchester University's academic phrase bank very useful, which you can actually uh, just Google it and then you can 
find it as well. It's a collection of phrases that are very commonly used in academic writing. So for example, um, if you want to if you if you want to write something about being cautious of what others have found in the past, then if you click here, being cautious like um, here on the website when you open this academic phrase bank, it will exact it will give you examples of the phrases that you can use to describe that which is uh, very useful and uh, also sometimes consulting this academic phrase book can help you help you find phrases that can um, be different than what you normally use means like you, you report, if your writing is repetitive then probably I, I using this academic phrase book can be very helpful because it will provide more uh, what is the options for using this i'll try to actually open this if it is possible um, and then see if you can actually see. For example, I mean, if you're not quite sure what I was talking about, like for example, being critical. If you want to actually, if you're discussing your uh, uh, literature review and if you want to highlight in education, in education and previous studies, then you can do it through different ways. So these are like these ways, these are the phrases that you can use, how previous research were not educated. Uh, so this is a kind of, uh, I think this can be very useful if you are new to writing and you're struggling with finding a uh, kind of uh, having, building up the vocabulary of phrases to improve or uh, impress your writing. So that's it, something you can actually uh, do. Um, now, after literature review, you would go to research context. If, uh, for example, this was about research about Nepalese geopolitical conflict in Nepal between India and China. So I, uh, when providing the research context, I also use this map to show where Nepal is, where the case I was discuss discussing below was situated and, 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 and where Nepal lies in between India and China. So when you look into the geopolitical conflict, the situation or the case discussed in the paper, then having a map would be very helpful for people to relate to. So this is something that you might actually, it could be research context could be your field as well. And there's a, if there's any special characteristics of your field, then you need to discuss that as well. On methodology, I don't really want to spend time on this. We all know like we need to actually have a clear details of what is needed in methodology. And I, I hope everyone knows what has to go in the methodology chapter, book, methodology section. But if you are publishing or if you are preparing a qualitative research, there are two things that's very important in the methodology. And this is the positionality or reflexivity of the author. Now, positionality means like uh, we all know and that a qualitative researchers are a very strong part of the research process in itself. So you have to actually situate how your position or why this research makes sense, why your, your, your presence in research um, if it has any implications on the findings or not. So you need to actually make sure that you, 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 you tell that to readers. And we all know that uh, you can actually discuss positionality by being reflective, reflective of yourself or your own place in the research process. So when you talk about reflexivity, we're talking about feelings, reactions, and mo motives that influences your research and also how these feelings, reactions actually influences the situation you are in basically. So if you are collecting the data, now you need to actually clearly be very aware of your presence. Is your presence having any impact on your participant? For example, if I go to Nepal to collect data, then for a Nepali respondent, this is a person who can speak Nepali, but this is a person who is employed in a British university in an English speaking university who comes with us for their opinion, they might actually see myself not as insider, but outsider. And in that case, I need to be very careful about not only about what they're speaking, but why you need to actually look into why they are saying this, because is it because you are collecting data that they, they are saying this, or would, it, would their narrative be the same if someone else or someone who is from Nepal collected the data. So you need to actually look into that, reflect on that whole data collection process and try to situate how your presence or how your own baggage that you bring into research can have influenced data collection. And the second thing is also your own baggage can also inform or influence 
the interpretation as well. For example, I, I, when I actually grew up in 1990s, Nepal was going through a big, important economic changes where Nepal had recently at the time implemented neoliberalism in its economic policies. Now, if I am the beneficiary of neoliberalism, then my ideas about the impact of neoliberalism will be different from those people who probably, if someone has left, uh, lost their job because of neoliberalism, then their idea about neoliberalism can be different. So when I go and collect data, they might actually see this guy comes from an uh, urban setup, uh, talks about, you know, has come from a Western country, which is actually a pioneer in this kind of Western capitalism. So they might actually have a different narrative to tell me if I collect the data. And I need to be very aware of that changes or if my presence has influence in the research or not. And that has to be very clearly expressed in your paper. Now, these are two examples of papers. Uh, these, I mean, the two examples of paragraphs from the, from the methodology of paper, two different papers, basically, where I've actually included these, how my own presence in the research has impacted. For example, I explained my own biographies are also very important in the interpretation of the, of the research and the whole, uh, how the research was done. So in you can actually look into these um, uh, text with the red underlines where actually I've actually provided this, these um, influence, how oh, my own positionality has some uh, impact on the research. And I think if you are writing a qualitative research, you have to have a paragraph on your positionality. I, I've actually noticed that in all my journal articles that I have submitted without a information about my positionality, I've actually got feedback from reviewers that I need to actually provide my positionality in the research process. And this is something that has to go we don't really always uh, give that in much importance to this, but this is very important part if you're thinking about publishing uh, qualitative research. Then we go to the findings and conclusion. Now, one thing we always uh, struggle when presenting findings is like, you have words of findings with, of any research. Important thing is you need to only discuss findings which are relevant for your study or relevant for your argument in the paper. So there is no need to use everything that you've actually found. You can actually, if there's a like a loads of findings, you can actually prepare, make two or three separate papers out of that study. But in my opinion, be, be very careful about the findings uh, and selection of what you want to say in the findings. The second thing about qualitative research is that and unlike quantitative research where numbers are data, in qualitative research, your participants' direct quotes are your data. So to argue anything, you might argue something, but you need to provide evidence to show that this comes from data or data also suggests this. And in that case, if to support your argument, you have to, re you have to present data and the data in this case would be the direct quote from your participant. So make sure that you bring verbatim quotes from your participant in strengthening your argument. Now, the second thing is, it's not enough to actually bring direct quotes, but you need to discuss the direct quotes as well, or why, how interpret the direct quotes, or, or interpret uh, how that makes sense. Now, when you do the interpretation, it's very important. I normally try to actually make sure that how this interpretation, you try to situate your this interpretation amongst other works in the area. So it is very important that we need to have some, uh, uh, you need to show strong evidence of wider reading and your familiarity with other research that have actually been done on the same subject, subject area so that your interpretation can be situated vis-a-vis -vis other studies in the topic area. Now, when preparing qualitative research or any kind of research, uh, one thing is like we try to say our story and we try to select, be selective in selection of quotes or selection of uh, uh, data in our uh, presentation of data in the uh, manuscript. Now, uh, my op in my opinion, uh, the beauty of qualitative research is it doesn't only take the majority or like a uh, 
basically majority view, but it also op provides opportunities for us to pick up minority views as well, data which are contrast, contrast or which are uh, slightly, which disagrees with your uh, argument. There would definitely be data that disagrees with your argument. And I think you have to actually identify those contrast and contradictions within the data and present that as well. Uh, and so, don't try to spoil your argument by bringing a very strong contrast. I don't actually do that for the sake of getting, because your chances of getting it published can be challenged by the reviewers. That's the thing. But I definitely try to represent contra contrast and contradictions in this study uh, to make sure that the, uh, I, 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 because that's the beauty of qualitative research. In the conclusion, uh, one important thing is it's not, conclusion is not the summary of what you've done. It is more about what next. So just try to answer what, so what question in the conclusion, which is very important. And also try to establish why, what you have found or what your, what, why your interpretation of the findings is important. So probe, make sure that um, you establish that in the findings. Now that's that's half part done. Preparing manuscript is only half of the, the task of getting published. Because in my opinion, choosing a right journal is very important uh, uh, as well. And that's sometimes difficult as well. Now, there are different ways you can choose your, your journals or like a home for your article. The first I would suggest, not the first, basically, uh, the key in deciding the journal is your own expertise in your subject area and you as a writer and as a researcher should know by yourself which journal is relevant to your work. Now, in my case, when I published my early publications during my PhD years, I actually choose the right journal for my research. But after you get employed in university, sometimes it is not under your control to choose your journals because uh, in the UK, we are influenced by REF and you want to publish in journals which are regarded high impact by the REF committees and which you can actually see from previous practices. And these can these things can influence as well. But my in my opinion, as the as a researcher, I think you should use your agency to decide where you want to publish, and that's very important. And you can choose what is best for you. Now, some journal, uh, some public publishers also have journal finder for your paper. So what you do is you can actually copy your abstract and put that abstract in journal finder. And based on your abstract, they can actually suggest which are the journals which are related to your subject area and you can actually submit in that. Now there are other like um, listing as well for the journals. Now in the UK, because uh, of the REF, uh, mostly in the business school, we are very much encouraged to submit papers which are or submit to journals which are listed in the Association of Business Schools in UK. And, and they, pub, they publish uh, our list of journal rank based on their ranking, basically. be list of academic journals every two, three years. And we normally try to focus in three or four star in that ABS list. And uh, that's the, the thing. If you are not quite sure about where to publish, then probably the easy way is to actually go to ABS list Association of Business Schools, journal rank ranking list, and choose three or four star if your work is that important. If it is not, I mean, if your work is, you think like you, you are making a strong international co contribution here, which is which is relatable, um, or which is which are or which is world leading in terms of your contribution, then probably you can actually just go and submit in the three or four star in the ABS list. Some uh, the other thing I'd say is about this is uh, about journal choice is. You can also decide based on your individual papers. So you might actually publish, uh, right, you have done a good piece of work and probably produce a kind of a draft paper. But, but based on your draft, you see that the contribution is not world leading, but you think that it has a strong national relevance. Then in that case, you actually probably can go for a two or three star journals in the ABS list, which you can actually do as well. But that means like based on individual papers that you actually draft, you can actually decide which journal to publish. Now, the key thing that I normally try to actually do when I prepare my manuscript is try to first avoid the desk rejection, because if you get desk rejection, the, the journal or your paper doesn't get to test its ideas or your argument, you don't have, uh, you, you, do, you don't get the time or like opportunity to test your argument. For that reason, I would ask 
uh, you to make sure that try your best to avoid debt rejection. And for that, you can do few things. Now, my, um, what is the, um, basically my list of things that I try to do is also drawn from what I have experienced in the past by getting some dex rejections. I did have some dex rejections, but also we have a journal called Annals of Tourism Research. And this is uh, managed by two man, uh, editor in chief, which one of these is Sarah Dorning. What Sarah does is like, she tweets every day about her experience of, um, managing the journal and she has actually sometimes she actually gets frustrated with the kind of undercooked papers and their deficiencies in papers and she also writes why she dex rejected these papers and it can so it provides sometimes a kind of a good um a, you know good views or you what you say um, in depth uh, um sight into a, what goes in the mind of editor in chips when deciding about sending the journal for reviews. Uh, so one very important thing to avoid this rejection is don't publish, submit your work to a journal which is not related to your subject area, first thing. The second thing is, and for that you need to do research on the journal before submission. If you're thinking about submitting in journal A, then you need to know what is the journal A. Do they publish like your kind of work? Is it only theory, you know, do they publish empirical research or do they only publish theoretical research? If it's, if your work is empirical, don't submit your work in a theoretical journals, which are actually more interested in publishing theories. Now, in this particular uh, case, like this is one of the tweets from and uh, Sarah, a few, few months back, and she said she rejected a paper, and one of the reasons was the paper didn't have anything tourism in it. And because this is a tourism journal, there's no point um, uh, getting this sent for reviews. Um, the other uh, is you need to actually, as I actually uh, told you, you need to actually find that you publish empirical, uh, you need to find whether they publish empirical paper or theoretical one. You need to actually stick to journal to guidelines. If it is too long, then probably you would get it dex rejected as well. Very importantly, and um, important I would say is check your similarity score. And to do that, you can use the university's Turnitin link as well, because most of these publishers do not use Turnitin, so it won't show over like uh, if, if when they check their, in their own system, it won't show that it has already been submitted in the Turnitin. So make sure that your work is not to more than 10%, I think would be a problem. Now, if you look into um, Shara's, um, uh, Sarah's uh, like two tweets here, what she says is like, she actually uh, got tech, text duplication of 15, 18, 18, uh, 30%, which was all rejected, text rejected. So basically, you need to make sure that your text duplication is very low and uh, otherwise you will get it rejected. Make sure your paper manuscript has sufficient data. We sometimes actually present too much of narrative interpretation and uh, without providing enough data in the, uh, in the uh, findings first thing. And the second thing is you also make sure that your data fit the theoretical explanation. Means like there is, there has to be a strong correlation between your data findings and the literature review. If your literature review is not connected with your data, that means like your work is not coherent piece of work. So make that, uh, this is, this happens. Again, I said, uh, use the direct course, explain methodology very well uh, and make sure that your methodology matches the research question. Now, um, and the final one is it has to be well-written, ensure writing is standard and get someone to actually check your writing if you're not sure about it. Uh, some journals actually do, uh, 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 you know, accept papers which are like not very, what do you say, uh, as long as it is, uh, it is good enough to be sent to reviewers most of the time your paper, even if there are like some, not writing errors, but grammatical errors and editors can actually send it for uh, reviews. But I would try to actually avoid that situation. And an uh, important thing is you need to choose a right and supportive journal. Now that's what that I mean by supportive is I want to actually show you the example of that particular right and supportive journal. Now, 
as I actually said it in the last uh, slide as well, ensure that the nature of your work or inquiry, nature of inquiry fits the journal because that's what the editor normally see in any paper submitted to their journal. And they would also look into the sample representativeness of sample and the mode of analysis would basically mean that um, if you are doing interpretation, then um, you, you, you know you need to actually make sure that this interpretation is credible. Is it uh, strongly inform is it realistically done or not? Now, coming to the earlier point about right supportive journal is like if on the right side of your screen you will see this letter from which was a rejection letter for a manuscript that I submitted for annals, and it did say a few things it identified. For example, this one you didn't give any details on your theoretical approach. This was one of the deficiency they I. The, I, it suggested in the re rejection letter. The other thing was the editor in chief also said, I think the data are a bit thin, it seems small sample and very low details on approach taken to analysis. The third one is he also said like positioning, positioning of wor work in terms of like theoretical positioning of work wasn't very clear. And, and so he suggested that I can actually look into more sources of data to corroborate my findings. Most important thing in this rejection letter was he said, I, uh, sorry, he said that in the second sentence up here, he said, I do think the article could be developed further and won't rule out the new submission. So he did give the opportunity for me to actually correct this paper and resubmit it again. And in the underlying work here, he did actually say, good luck in developing your idea. So this gave me the indication that, oh, there's some possibility of this work again, getting submitted, uh, resubmitted. So what I did was like, I made all the changes required, requested in that next rejection later and submitted again, which ultimately got published in the Annals of Tourism Research. So basically next rejection is not all outright rejection. Sometimes it can help you identify your deficiency errors and correct that. And then you can again, re either submit in the same journal if they allow, otherwise you can actually submit in a other journal. In the past, I've actually submitted something in a third three-star journal, which got rejected. And then I corrected that and submitted in a four-star journal, which got published. So it was the re rejection was better for me in that case. Now, if you are targeting, I'm not almost like finishing now. If you are targeting for ref, uh, if you're in from UK, then just make sure that you, um, uh, you, you focus on originality, significance, and rigor in your study. So make sure that um, your work uh, has uh, something at least new or original. They are significant, as, uh, and make sure that all these element of refs criteria are strongly met when you write your paper. And uh, one final thing I'd like to actually spend one more minute on is try to have reflect on your own research plan and try to build your research publication strategy or personal publication strategy. Do you want to publish in a high ranked journal? Because sometimes what happens, uh, these high ranked journals can have written a very harsh reviews. Now that can be very discouraging if you are an early career or if you are new to publication, uh, the, the, the publication scene, scene basically. So I'd suggest you have to decide whether you, or you can start with a slightly less ranked journal, less regard one or two star journals, and then gradually build your profile to actually submit in a higher line, a higher impact journal. Now I said it again, don't have a generic strategy that I only, I'll only publish a paper in four star journals, but you can actually based on your findings and based on your manuscript, you can decide where to publish. Now actually choosing a more multi-author or you have to actually also decide whether you want to publish in a uh, you know, uh, publish, coll collaborate with others and publish a multi-author paper, or do you want to just single author it? Now, I think multi-author paper can um, bring a skill mix because other, paper contribute, other authors can contribute to the paper as well. And also to the editors, it can show some sort of you know, assurance of quality as well, credibility as well, because if there are more than five scholars, renowned scholars are involved, then probably it will somehow suggest that uh, the work is of a good quality. And sometimes having some big names in the list of authors can help. And if you are collaborating with some big names in your field, it can help, especially uh, it can help in the 
uh, dex rejection part basically because uh, if there's a big name then it's more likely that you would not get dex rejection but that doesn't always apply i had a, one of the biggest name with uh, me when we submitted a paper which was dex rejected by a journal who, who he which he was co-editing basically so the thing is like they can be these things can be very fair uh, so uh, but the thing is like still so sometimes it does impact influence if there's a big name in the list of authors so collaborating is also important if you're thinking about that this is the final slide and if there's any question i'll be very happy to answer that i try to actually put it within 30 40 minutes actually but slightly went over 40 minutes but i hope this was all fine can i stop sharing chris yes you you can't kalyan thank you so much for that i think uh if uh, to generalize it really I, I found it very valuable very informative and i'm sure uh everybody would have found that as well it's not unfortunate that we don't have so much time for questions but it was quite it was good very interesting a lot of people are saying thank you so much so we try to take one or two questions uh, before we go. So anybody that wants to ask a question, I think there's one question on the chat already. Sandra is giving you a clap, that's good. So any question for Talian? Any question? I think there's some questions in the chat. There's there questions, yeah, in the chat, yes. Yeah, but anybody that wants to, anybody that's- Okay, I need to, to actually go, I need to actually just give me, just excuse me because I wasn't actually going, I'm going through the meeting chat here. Okay. And just, okay. Uh, Okay, let, okay, let, let's go through the chat then. I think there are a couple of Okay, questions. there's one by Imin Al-Ajori. Um, so uh, uh, my question is, how do we approach and reflect positionality in the case of multiple author paper? I would say this is a very interesting question because I have all my publications have been single author. Um, honestly, there's only few papers that I have actually published um, collaborated uh, collaborated on paper, but in multi-author paper as well. Sometimes if someone is a native, for example, there, then pro or uh, sometimes uh, this reflectivity can actually bring, like uh, you, you, you can actually reflect on the team uh, as well. Like you can, this paper, you can describe how different people contributed to the, 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 the paper and also bring their background as well. So, and the thing is like, if there's something that like, who did the data collection basically, and did that have impact on the data, the, the how, what data was collected or what data was actually uh, got in the process that you can actually reflect on that. But I think you can actually, uh, you can also inform um, uh, I, if there is someone who has contributed more in the interpretation of data, like in the multiple, uh, you know, authors paper, what happens is like, or not everyone actually can be uh, maybe involved in the interpretation. So probably try to actually see if the person who does interpretation or who did the interpretation has any impact of their positionality in the interpretation, or did that interpretation was actually re reinterpreted in the process of refining the paper? And did that have impact on the findings or your main argument? Then probably you need to actually bring that as well. Uh, so you can actually bring the team's dynamics and how these team's background contributed to that paper, but did that background have any impact or influence or impact on the paper or your argument? I think you can actually discuss that as well in the, in, in, in the multiple author paper, which is possible to do. Okay, I, I done has two questions i want to ask about republishing the master thesis work as a paper considering considering that the thesis has already been published by university i want to know if it need to completely rewrite or if i can simply utilize sentence as they are excellent question and i also was wondering if high rank journals would accept an article from new publisher from a new publisher or if previous experience of research is taken into account okay and the first instance yes. I think if you master, you can actually publish your master thesis dissertation as a paper in a paper form. There's nothing wrong with that. Now, if your public master thesis has already been uploaded on the internet, and when you publish your paper, create create your draft, and if it shows as a copy from that source, then 
you need to probably rewrite the whole thing because there's self you, you can't really self plagiarize as well so you cannot publish something which is already published i know like um, you know it's a slightly tricky one if it's msc dissertation but i would suggest you to rewrite the thing and then the thing is like make sure that you check that on the turnitin link to so see that this is not it doesn't store right like reputation there i try to actually avoid now i have in the when i was doing my phd i did publish some of my phd chapters as a paper and at the time of my submission, I, there was a huge uh, confusion of, about that, basically, um, because uh, was um, if it was tested on Turnitin, my, my thesis was if put on Turnitin, then it would have actually shown similarity because much of this one also was already published in papers, right? But my I had a discussion with my supervisor and with the university as well, and the Glasgow University from where I did my PhD, they suggested that uh, the ultimate aim of doing a PhD is to get publish a paper. If you actually publish a paper without before doing a PhD on the research that you did as part of PhD, then your work as basically you are achieving one of the objectives of doing the PhD. So that's absolutely fine. And so the university didn't really ask me to put my submission through Turnitin because they said like it will return a high high similarity score. So I didn't really do that. But the thing is, the best way to do is to rewrite it. Uh, my answer would be the second one. Uh, I, I don't think the highly ranked journals would like to see the name. Uh, it's more about your manuscript, your story in the paper that is important. Now, some as I told you, name can be important. Um, sometimes uh, it can be important in avoiding dex rejection, but because like it, it, people I and mean, editor in chiefs don't really say that uh, the name of the sub, you know, a contributor actually uh, author makes any difference in deciding about the paper. But sometimes there can be un what do we say unconscious bias if they already know that someone has already published paper in big journals. But I think even you can submit you can submit your work in high ranked journals. And that's absolutely fine. Uh, I don't think I had, uh, when I published my work uh, in Annals, which was like a four, four star journal, I had published anything before in Annals. I knew no one in Annals. I still actually got my paper, which was actually dexed, rejected in the first instance for high similarity. It was a different paper, uh, which they said like it, uh, I think it was 11% or something like that, but the editor in chief said like, this looks like an intentional, um, uh, 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 similarity, but try to re paraphrase some of the sentences, check it in your software and do that. And so I did, but I think you can publish, we can try to submit in Highland Journal as well, even if you don't, if you are a new one. And, and there are like, if you look into, I've actually seen some big journals and they do have like a very novice scholars work published there. So they would normally publish. Um, yeah, I think there are no there are no questions on in the chat again. I think most of them are just feedback and saying thank you, thank you. I know I know we have run out of time, and I, I'm mindful of the I'm mindful of the fact that we have we don't have time at all. And of course, talent has to be out. But is there any other question? Any but just one pressing question before we before end the session? So Muhammad had something to say, Muhammad. Okay, Muhammad. Yeah. Uh, Mohammed, thanks for coming. I didn't know you were raising up your hand. Mohammed, you're on. We can't hear you. You're not on mute, but for some reason, your sound is not coming. It might. It might be the headset, Mohammed. I think yeah. yeah. Because it, okay. No. We still. We still can't hear you, Mohammed. Who is Mohammed? God now. Mm -hmm. We can't see you now. <laughs> I think I think he's he's gone. I don't know whether he's he's gonna be able to come back in. So I can okay, I can see everyone, but we can't see Mohammed again. Mohammed is here, right? So who is Mohammed? Why didn't his microphone like worked briefly and then when started talking, it went off again. Yeah, I think it happens it happens sometimes. Mohammed, we can't hear you. Maybe if you try to remove the headset. Yeah, I mean your your earpiece and try to use it use it without it. It might work. Uh, 
Okay. No, uh, uh, anyone else, like, if they have questions, I can still, like, be here for 10 minutes and 15 minutes. That's fine. I need to actually go about, not before, like, half two. So the thing is, like, if the, because I can actually see still, like, 30, 35 people participant in this uh, room. So basically, if anyone else have any questions, please feel free to ask me. And I'll try to answer it. I mean, I can't really have answer to all the questions, but I'll try to actually share my experience. I think Mohammed is saying that he has uh, technical okay. issues. So I think I think that's it. But, but any oh, Muhammad, other... can you write your web? If you, I mean, if if it's a question, you can write as well. Okay, as we're waiting for Mohammed to write his question, anybody that wants to ask a, a question, I'm okay, not sure. Nino. Okay. So we just, we, we, I'm sorry okay, that we okay, are taking up time, yeah. Okay, first, okay. Uh, uh, Christian, there is a question by Muhammad about literature review best paper. Uh, no, Muhammad, no, it's not Muhammad, it's by Muhammad Mostain. Mostain. Okay, yeah. not uh, Isaac, okay, that's fine. Any suggestion? I mean, I don't really get the question here clearly, but I think literature review best question means like, uh, paper means like, if you're talking about theoretical paper, then uh, I would suggest um, uh, theoretical papers are actually uh, um, difficult to write, I would say, um, but you can actually follow the same structure that I actually suggested. If you think asking about structure, basically you need to identify the problem. The only thing is like your data in that case would be your review of literature and insight from what you have read. And then you try to actually create a discursive analysis of what uh, to answer that question, basically. But uh, for a literature review best paper, I mean, I think it can, it depends like how, how robust and how rigorous your analysis is. If your analysis is rigorous and if your findings are different and if you're suggesting completely new paradigm based on what you've studied in the past, then I would say this, um, that's, that's, that's uh, you can actually go for a high end journals. But if you are thinking about using literature review that you've done for part of your PhD or MSc and then want to use it in a kind of a paper, then probably I would say if it is not making a huge contribution from or providing a new insight, but you're identifying a problem that can be important for future just scholars, then probably you can actually go for a slightly lower line of papers, um, but they can actually be published as well. Some papers actually are asked for uh, what is that called conceptual papers based on literature review. So if you're identifying, suggesting any new concepts uh, based on your literature review, then you can actually publish and you can submit that. But the thing is, like, key thing is, you do need to have a methodology, you need to have uh, all the sections that I discussed before, because there was a discussion about whether you need a strong methodology for a conceptual or literature review based paper. And the, the, all the journal editors said, like, it would apply the same standard because even if you're doing a literature, you need to have a proper process or structure for reviewing literature, otherwise it won't be validated. So try, try to actually keep that in mind. Now there's a question by Mohammed Isaac. It's of a comment, but too long. It's essential that get bogged down with journal ranking. Often high-end journals are very theory-based and not always a Excellent, uh, Mohammed, I do believe what you said, and I totally agree, completely agree with you. And I remember Mohammed, I think uh, five, seven years back, we had a meeting about something and uh, Mohammed actually said the same thing. And I'm very happy that you still have the same consistent voice about uh, <laughs> the high-end journals. I definitely agree with that. Now, when I published first five, six papers, I didn't really know the existence of REF and I didn't know about that journals are high and low ranked basically. So I submitted articles in journals which mattered to me and which I thought would be the right or appropriate journal for my subject area where and then I submitted the, on those journals. But later on, after I moved to business school, then I actually knew about this competition in publishing high end journals, which I actually started publishing. Now, I don't think everyone has to publish in high-end journals. And also, you don't really have to publish in high-end journals every paper, basically, in your career, like uh, two or three journals in high 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 end would be probably enough if you are constantly publishing, getting money. Uh, I think that can be helpful as well for the university career progression as well. Uh, but I definitely, I believe that you should only publish for the, you should try to strive to publish in journals which matter to you most, which matter to your more, more, most. And, and, 
and also which makes a more contribution uh, or impact in the area that you have chosen, not by the ranking, but by the relevancy of your work. And um, excellent. Yes, I agree with you, Mohammed. I think Nina wanted to ask something. Uh, yeah, Dr. Saudian, yeah. Um, my question is related to uh, the one that you just commented. In Indonesia, we tend to write in journal, in, in the Scopus journal, because, mm -hmm. because if you are not writing in the Scopus journal, uh, we don't have any credit for that. And I mean, you already explained that, that in UK, uh, we, don't, we don't see as high or low ranking, but still in some countries, including Indonesia, we are encouraged to aim that high ranking journal. So it's kind of difficult for us as uh, the one that are new to writing journals to achieve that. So what, no, you, I, what are your suggestions? I see, I mean, you know, it's not like in the UK as well, there's a huge competition to publish in high end of three or four star journals, because the thing is, there's a ref exercise that happens every five, five to six years here in the UK. And if you're published in, and these ref actually, I didn't, it's a kind of for the, normally you submit all your publications, like five publications for ref, and they assess your publication and based your contribution, they can actually decide three, two, one, star four three two one stars right but the thing is if your work is already published in a high ranked journal in abs list then it's likely that your paper will be also ranked highly by ref for that reason many business school and universities actually want you to publish in three or four stars so that when you submit in ref then uh, it's very likely that it would get three or four stars some universities do not include any any journal articles which are below two star, three star to, to for submission in ref so basically if you publish articles in two star journals and then some universities don't really even submit that for ref basically this even uws as well in 2014 we didn't really submit the two star journals at the time that's because the university said they only wanted to submit in the three and four stars so there is a pressure uh, for publishing in a high-end journals and a big universities have a big pressures uh, for school people working in big universities have big competitions as well for my my own value value system is slightly different. And I agree with what Muhammad already earlier said as well. I think your, your relevance of your work and you need to identify where your work makes most contribution and where it fits in more. Uh, that should decide. Sometimes what happens if you are targeting high-end journals then probably what happens is like you have to change your research interest because something in some disciplines they don't there is no three or four star journals. And in that case, people have to actually switch their research interest to the journals which have are in three and four star to actually slightly tweak the research, which I don't really like. And so it's not a quest for like for research is about your own and you know, uh, in a, what do you say, inquiry into things that interest you. And for that reason, I would say publishing work that you think matter most. Um, okay. Then, okay, Galen, sorry to interrupt you because you are running yeah. out of time. If, if we continue okay. the debate about uh, this uh, journal, because this, 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 this is a debate that we, of course, the academics, we have been talking about it from the beginning. How viable is the ABS list? How good, how good is it? Because at the end, are you publishing just to, to, to hit the three or four star? Even for the ref outcome, I think Mohammed is saying it here. Some of those papers that are in three star quality or on the ABS list, when, when they go through the ref exercise that we are always involved in, you see that they might be putting in, in the two. And those ones that are two might end up becoming three. So we have so, seen yeah, cases whereby exactly these things tend to happen. But either way, so I don't, I think we have run out of time and thank you so much, uh, Kalyan, for the very informative presentation. Uh, Mohammed is saying that we criticize a lot of this. Yeah, yeah I, I do. I, I completely agree with Mohammed, basically, yes. I don't really also um, constantly yeah. actually on, I only, not only target the three star or four star, basically. I don't really mind about that. But the thing is, I look into relevancy of my work, you know, yeah. where I think my work can make a long-term impact. And that's where I actually submit my work. And, and the truth is really, of course, we as a school as well, we also try to push people to, to make sure they submit. Just, I think the, the end of, end result of it is try to target a three or four star, but don't let, let, let it not limit you. If you can get into a three or four star, great. If you can't get in everything that uh, Kalin has said, at the end, 
right research that that motivates you that makes makes you wake up in the morning that you're happy to do i think that's it because if you're not happy with your research then of course you will not be motivated in academia in the first place but thank you so much uh dr Callium, for the wonderful presentation uh we found it very useful a lot of people are asking for the slides uh, i'm sure uh Callium will send the slides across and i will be able to send it across to everyone the recording is available will be available on our youtube channel so make sure you go to uh, uws uh, the School of Business, and you will see it there. So you, if you missed out anything, you can always go back and listen to Dr. Kalian again. And in two weeks' time, we'll be having another uh, seminar. That was different. That will be man and your limitations. You have, you need to know your limitations as 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 an academic, and it it's, it boils down to what Kalian was talking about about reflexivity. But you're going to have a scholar from Manchester that will be talking about auto ethnography and how to how he was able to work on that so but either way thanks everyone for attending thank you so much for everybody that came and of course special thanks to Italian for making this a wonderful day thank you so much and have a nice day everyone and thank you everyone thank you very much Christian for the opportunity I really enjoyed it and, mm -hmm. and I hope other people uh, some of these slides were really useful to the participants as well thank you very much okay thank you Thank you, Kalyan. Super presentation. Thank, thank you, Pravin. Take care.